just watch your step on the sports at least. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you for listening, waking up this morning, coming to this conference and listening to my presentation. Um, so before I dive into the research aspect of my presentation, I'd just like to give a brief introduction of myself and address some of the questions as to why I'm here and maybe some things that you're thinking of. Um, so this is me, my name is Alex, and I'll just give you a little brief like little moral uh, just to begin your day, maybe shake off the nerves before you guys present. Um, so a lot of things had to fall perfectly in place in order for me to be here today. For instance, I had to volunteer at the hospital on one specific day and meet one specific person, Linda, who was an animal care coordinator at my university. And because of her, she offered me the opportunity to go and look at all the different research labs at the University of Windsor that dealt with animal research. And out of all of those labs, I became interested in one of them that dealt with brain cancer research. And because of my interest, I decided to apply, eventually got an interview, luckily. Um, and through Linda's recommendation, I eventually was accepted into that one specific lab. See. Um, and then after um, numerous months of volunteering, I was approached by research associates and encouraged to apply for the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada studentship. And my application with the help of my laboratory, my research associate, mentor, supervisor, also because I met Linda that one specific day, I was eventually awarded the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada studentship, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but the moral of the story is that a lot of things had to fall perfectly into place. Just like in research, you need a lot of things to work um, for an experiment to go well. So for instance, if I didn't meet Linda that one specific day, or if I didn't even choose to go into and apply for that lab, I would never be here today. So if something doesn't go right, don't be discouraged just keep moving forward because it could have just been one little area that went wrong. Um, but this presentation isn't about my journey, it's also about what I learned through research and what research has given to me. So um, a lot of the things that I've gained through research is um, definitely spending countless nights, in, countless nights and days in cell culture, which has elevated my passion for learning. I've also had the opportunity to um, mentor and be mentored. I've been able to go in the community, participate in multiple community events like the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada annual walks, also events like Concerts for a Cure and Play for a Cure, which raises money for cancer research. So it's allowed me to be a true advocate for cancer research. Um, I've also held positions in animal care research because of my connection through Linda and also with Windsor Cancer Research Group. So it's provided me so many opportunities and for that I am very grateful. So with that being said, I'd like to say many thanks to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada and most notably the Tate Boomer Foundation um, for providing students like myself this wonderful opportunity. So thank you. And with that being said, I'll now jump into the research portion of my talk. So I'll be talking about a novel approach to dissecting the heterogeneity behind brain tumors. So brain tumors or tumors in general, why are they so complex and why are they so difficult to understand? So not all cancer cells in a tumor mass are the same. Differences can arise in, heter in uh, genomics and proteomics, and this can even be the reason why after a patient receives countless amounts of chemotherapy and treatment, that cells are still lingering behind. So although all the cancer cells compose the tumor mass, not all of them play an equal role in initiating and propagating a tumor. So there's a small subset of cells that have been identified um, that have very immature stem cell-like characteristics and initiate certain tumors when they are transplanted into animal models. And these are known as conveniently, brain tumor initiating cells, or BTICs for short. 
and VTICs have been shown through past literature to drive glioblastoma multiform, or GBM, which is one of the most aggressive forms of brain cancer with a median survival rate of about 15 months. And GBM is categorized into three different subtypes based on genomics, which is proneural, mesenchymal, and classical. So depending on the subtype and even the individual, therapy responses can vary drastically. And the variance in the therapy responses is hypothesized to arise due to those different populations of the brain tumor initiating cells, which prompts the need to try and identify those BTIC populations, target them, and try to attack those specific cells. But how do we tackle such a problem? So there's been ample amounts of data that has been published on certain markers that when they're presented on the surfaces of cells, they're indicative of those BTIC populations. So three of the most well-known, well-characterized cell surface markers are CD133, CD44, and CD15, two proteins and a carbohydrate respectively. And when these markers are presented on the surface of cells, they're associated with characteristics like aggressiveness, invasion, and stemness. So we decided to set out to isolate all the different populations that we can from these three different cell surface markers. So just for clarity, uh, we could have a population that has two of those cell surface markers, the first protein and the last carbohydrate, or one that has all three, which we would hypothesize would be the most aggressive or most therapy resistant just due to past literature or one that is completely depleted of those cell surface markers and all the populations in between. So this leads or led to my hypothesis, which is that the combinations of those selective markers determine those BTIC populations, which have diverse functions within the GBM subtypes, and that SPI1, which is a cell cycle regulator, regulates those specific BTIC populations. So my objectives were to establish a reservoir of those different populations mentioned previously to study their different characteristics, look at the effects contemporary medicine has on them, and then determine the role of that cell cycle regulator SPI1. So in order to do this, we would have to sort out all the different populations, and this can be done through various methods. One of the most uh, well-known methods is fluorescence activated cell sorting, or FACS for short. And FACS is done by creating a concoction with a heterogeneous sample, um, also adding the fluorophore antibodies that are specific for your desired um, cell surface markers. And then through laser technology, those different fluorophores can then be identified and the cells can be isolated in that way. And this will lead to the establishment of that reservoir, which would be this brain tumor initiating cell bank, which then could be used for future collaboration or even research if the populations are frozen down. And then this would lead to the establishment of those eight possible pop populations from those three different cell surface markers, which are outlined in this table here below. Um, so to begin my project, we established a collaboration with Henry Ford Hospital across the border in which we were generously donated nine patient GBM lines three from each of those genomic subtypes outlined in the flow cytometry uh, graph here. And the first experiment we decided to run was a flow cytometry analysis of the cellular uh, cell surface markers. And the flow cytometry uses the same aspects as the fluorescence activated cell sorting, but just looks at the ex expression rather than sorting out the cells. So what we found was that there are some distinct differences between the cell lines and also between those genomic subtypes, which showed that it was a worthwhile thing to look at for our research purposes. So after we sorted out those eight populations via facts, we decided to just start looking at all the possible differences that we could find. So we first began with um, cell proliferation kinetics in which the different populations were seeded at a common starting point and then grown over time. And we found some significant differences between those populations. And then we also looked at the cell cycle profiles of those cells, and we interestingly found that some of the cells actually contained high amounts of tetraploidy. But we didn't want to just stop there. We decided to look at more differences, so we decided to construct an organoid growth formation assay in which we could take those uh, populations that we sorted, 
um, select for tumor spheres with specific media that selects for it, grow them into the tumor spheres so that they would form those, and then after a few days, we'd then be able to embed them into an extracellular matrix, which mimics the tumor environment in the brain. And this would eventually lead to the formation of our brain tumor organoid, in which we can then look at the growth differences between the population, also looking at invasiveness and migration. So from our organoid development, over a 24 day period, you can see the drastic differences of how these cells began to migrate and invade into the surrounding metrogel. Um, and we also found significant differences of growth there as well. But we didn't want to just stop at growth differences. We also wanted to look at the effects that contemporary medicine has on it, has on these different populations, and how drug resistant these populations are. So we decided to construct a Hooke's efflux assay, which is one of the most interesting findings that we have found thus far. And so what this assay does is you take your neurosphere single cell suspension sample and incubate it with a Hooke's dye. And after a while, populations that have more of this Hooke's dye will be more drug sensitive and populations that have less of the Hooke's dye will be um, more drug resistant. So what happens during this incubation period is that Hooks is actually able to passively diffuse into the membrane and then into the nucleus where the Hooks can then bind to the DNA adenine thymine regions. But if there are ABCG1 or G2 transporters present on the surfaces of the cells, that Hooks can actually be actively pumped out of the cell, kicked out or effluxed. So that would be mirroring the drug resistance that you see in patient samples, um, just with the Hooks dye as the mimic. So we decided to subject this assay to our populations that we sorted, and we found that there are some differences between the populations, some exhibiting high efflux and some exhibiting low efflux. But we didn't want to stop there either, so we identified a high efflux population and a low efflux population, and we wanted to subject these to contemporary medicines used in clinics today to see if it was representative of this Hooks assay. And what we found was that the low efflux BTIC cell populations actually showed, actually showed way more cell death than the high efflux populations, which would correlate to our Hooks assay. And one of the most interesting things was that the high efflux cell line that we chose actually had all three of those cell surface markers, which means that it would be very drug resistant, which follows past literature. And our low efflux cell line that we chose to study actually had none of those cell surface markers, which would also follow past literature and mean that it is less drug resistant. Sadly, we know that after um, contemporary medicine is given to patients, there may be a spike and a lot of those cell populations can die, but after time, um, a lot of the cell death will eventually plateau and the cells will then be kicked back into the cell cycle and proliferation will continue to occur. So one of the cell cycle regulators that we study in my lab specifically is known as SPI1. And SPI1 is able to associate with CDK1 and CDK2 in order to push the cell back into proliferation, skipping those cell cycle checkpoints, therefore enhancing uh, proliferation and clonal expansion. So we decided to look at the SPI1 expression in those different sort of populations. And what we found was there was one specific population that had SPI1 highly upregulated in, in two different subtypes, proneural and mesenchymal. And the, that population only had one of those cell surface markers, the carbohydrate. Whereas the population that had SPI1 to a very low extent had absolutely none of those cell surface markers. So, Along with this QRT-PCR, we did look at the proliferation markers and therapy resistance markers of those specific populations that had high and low SPI1 levels. So in the low SPI1 levels, or sorry, in the high SPI1 levels, we found that the proliferation marker was highly increased, and in comparison to the low SPI1 level, as you can see here, where the low SPI1 level is the one with no cell surface markers, uh, identified by minus, 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 and in this, similarly, this was seen in the mesenchymal subtype as well, where going from high SPI1 
the one with just the carbohydrate, the purple one there, going to the one that has no cell surface markers, low SPI1, had a decrease of therapy resistance as well. Which begs the question, does SPI1 play a role in the regulation of therapy resistance and proliferation in these big tick populations, specifically in those subtypes? So what we did was we subjected those pop the populations that had low SPI1 levels to a lentiviral overexpression. So we overexpressed the SPI1 in those cells, and after this successful overexpression, we ran another QRT PCR to see if the therapy resistance and proliferation markers had changed, changed at all, and we found a significant increase when SPI1 was increased in the proliferation and the therapy resistance in the proneural and mesenchymal subtypes, respectively, which suggests that SPI1 plays a role in the specific populations for those specific subtypes. And so that is where I am with my research right now. Um, so my future directions are to expand the pool of patient samples, which we are working on right now with the collaboration in Windsor, um, to then test the stability to a greater extent for the cultured cells in vitro, in vitro excuse me, uh, to conduct further gene expression analysis, also do more functional drug assays to test more of those uh, contemporary medicines used in clinics today, and then further manipulate SPI1, hopefully reaching an in vivo model in the future. And then just a big overview and uh, significance of my project, we are able to take a heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous tumor from a patient sample, um, we're able to sort it through the various sorting methods, either magnetic bead sorting or fluorescence activated cell sorting, establish that reservoir or brain tumor initiating cell bank, and then run different types of analyses on it like genomic and proteomic or in vivo and in vitro analysis. Um, and then we can hopefully identify different signatures which will lead to targets like SPI1 that I talked about specifically which will hopefully lead to novel individualized therapies for patients down the line. And with that being said, I'd just like to thank Dr. Lisa Porter, uh, my supervisor, and Dr. Dorota Lubinska, my mentor, for their compassion, support, and patience. I'll also give a shout out to my lab fam, and um, thank you all for listening, and thank you to our sponsors and funding. Thank you. So basically, you take like the patient samples, um, you make sure that they are suspended in like a single cell manner. Um, then with specific types of media, you can select for them to grow into tumor spheres so that they actually aggregate as one rather than growing separate um, zero spheres. Um, and then this is also done with a, a well plate that will sink all your cells to the bottom so they'll all aggregate there, therefore forming an actual sphere. And then with the specific type of media, obviously selects for it to a better extent than other types. And then you just embed it into an actual extracellular matrix, which depending on what, what type of matrix you want, whether it's derived from like an actual patient sample or from like an animal and people model, um, you just embed it into one of those matrices and then grow it over time like you would in some culture. So would you say the cell population in the organoids you can do either one. For mine, we try to do it um, homogenous, I guess, because of those sort of populations that we chose. Um, but like, you can form an organoid without doing the sorting. So this was one of our most interesting findings. So hooks is just a cell dye that will actually get into the cell. So it, it passively transports, which means that it can just go in without any sort of 
um, energy loss to the cell. It doesn't have to be pumped in. Um, and then once it's inside of the cell, it's able to go into the nucleus and get into the DNA. And that will label the cell, um, which then can be seen through like flow cytometry, which is basically, basically just like a laser identifying that there is that hooked dye in that cell. But some cells or some populations have a certain protein, which is an ABC transporter on the surface of those cells that is able to actually take that hooks before it intercalates, or if it's intercalating and unintercalating, then it can pump it out of the cell. And that's what actually happens um, when cells are drug resistance, re resistant, it could actually pump it out before it intercalates with DNA, depending on what type of chemotherapy or therapy you're using. Does that sort of yeah, answer your question? Yeah, like this assay is in mine, like I didn't create this assay, but what we found with those specific populations was my research here. Yeah. Yes. Hey Alex, Hi. Um, I have a question. Do you know the genetic um, molecular background of the tumor cells you're using? Because you know, I know for GBMs, they have the IDH and MDMP mutation. Mm -hmm. And then, but for the specific target, you look at SPI1. Yes. Because you know one of the common mutations of uh, GBM is like the cycling. Mm -hmm. It's also in a cell cycle regulation yeah. pathway, yeah. yeah. Do, do you know the status of that one? Because it might be important for your um, body, I see. We, we don't know. Uh, well, I mean, we haven't run the specific assays for that. Like, we haven't done um, genome analysis yet. Where we're hoping to plan to do that in the future. Um, but I'm not sure if the specific mutation you're talking about is incorporated in the GBM subtypes. Do you know if it is? It's an important predictor for the survival, right? The CAD. Yeah. yeah. But is it is it included in the subtypes, the genomic subtypes? You know, like if it's like mesenchymal proneural classical? Actually, the mesenchymal proneural, those are not genomic subtypes. Those are the phenotypes, I think, right? The genomic ones we are talking about usually are the IDH mutated, well biased. Yeah, but the, the uh, they are the genomic subtypes. Like those, those are the classifications okay. of them. Um, but I'm not 100 percent sure about like the the cycle in D1. Yeah, because uh, it's interesting. Well, I don't think I don't know. You correct me if I'm wrong, too, but I don't think we talk about those subtypes so much. We don't. We don't. It's it's interesting. The the paper came out with those. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing is that like there used to be four subtypes, or some still argue that there are four subtypes. Um, but for me specifically, like I was looking more of the cell surface marker protein expression and carbohydrate expression. So for my purposes, like I could even potentially create a new sub, like new subtypes based on just the protein expression rather than looking at the, the genes inside. I think that's part of the fear in GBM that subtypes are going to be. More subtype and even more subtype. Yeah. Pretty soon it's back to multi form again. Um, so. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I definitely want to do something um, along these lines, um, but I just don't know yet. <laughs> Still. A little bit of time to decide. But yeah. Well, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, we're pleased to have supported this and uh, pleased to have you here with us today and also pleased.